to Napoli. Um, I am originally a pediatrician. And I spent most of my life working in the area of the biology of development. And in that, I became fascinated and think in terms of where we come from and where we're going as a species and as individuals within it. And the challenge is to understand what is happening at a population level, within populations, and within individuals across their life course. And that's where most of my research with a strong biological basis comes from. In that title, which has disappeared in my talk, there are two words that matter. One is adolescence, and I'll explain what I mean by adolescence in a moment. And the other is the word technological. Because what distinguishes humans from any other species on the planet is, of course, the way we have the skill and the, and the ability to develop and use technology. We recognize it started about two million years ago when we first developed this, the primitive stone tools. And then there have been three major events of what I call technological significance, quite relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. The first happened about a 9, 10, 11,000 years ago, when we started to develop the ability to, to, to act for agriculture. And it was with agriculture and the ability to just live within towns, villages, which require you have agriculture, that the human uh, conditions start to change. Second major challenge is Change was 200 years ago, or 250 years ago, with the start of the two parallel changes, the Industrial Revolution, in which we saw a massive change in the way in which humans could use technologies. At the same time, and perhaps not uh, coincidentally, we saw the start of the Enlightenment, at which human beings start to value human beings in a different way to which they did and social responsibility started to emerge. And I'll come back to the significance of that momentarily. And the third change we might say we're in the middle of now. And that's this change in the way, and I'll talk at length about this, in which we use technologies to communicate with each other and to interact with each other. And I think these three changes thought about as a continuum, albeit uh, spread over 11,000 years of a 200,000 year history of the modern human species is something in which you have to think about all the time in thinking about young people in the modern world today. Because each of those changes has had impact on how young people grow up. The point I'm making is that for 190,000 years of our evolution, as a species. The processes of evolution matched our bodies, our brains, and our behavior, the environment in which we live, or the environment in which our ancestors But each of these subsequent changes has happened at such a speed and such a pace as a potential for what I call a mismatch to emerge between our innate biology and the world we live in. And it is that mismatch between our innate biology, be it in terms of the fact that I wear glasses because I'm short-sighted, or I'm at risk of getting diabetes because I've got a fat belly, or in the way young people uh, cope with the world they live in that we're really thinking about today. Why do I have short-sightedness? Well, we now know that as the eyeball grows, in childhood, if you're not exposed to about two hours a day of being able to see the environment, the, the horizon, your eyes all don't, don't grow in the right shape, you end up short-sighted, if you've got the genes that lead to short-sightedness. And the way to stop short-sightedness developing is for young children to spend their time outside, uh, in, uh, playing in fields where there's a long distance to see. The point being, so many children now live in urban environments and built environments that those who have the gene that predisposes to short-sightedness 
you now develop short sightedness that didn't before. There's many people in the world that are intolerant of milk, particularly from Asia and Africa. Why do they have that? Because they grew up in societies of 11,000 years ago, didn't develop dairy farming, didn't use milk as a source of nutrition, and short childhood, did cow's milk, and they didn't evolve to keep the gene that allowed you to digest milk properly, and so forth. Now, there's some other features of this which I think are very interesting to know about. Now, I won't, don't have time to go into them in detail because I know you want to get the method of the young kids don't go into the talk. The first is we know with fairly good certainty that humans evolved to live in groups of no more than 80 to 120 people. We know that from looking at the size of the part to the brain of all the primate species and relating it to the group size they live in and seeing uh, and putting humans on that line. We know it from some bits of anthropological evidence. And we also know it if we look at modern societies. We actually can, if you look at how people structure themselves up to recently, 20 years ago, even in large urban environments, their network of people was actually a series of small villages. They've all started to change with the development of the telephone and the motor car, and it's been accelerated in recent years. The other thing we also know is that humans develop culture. And culture has many meanings to different people, but if I just, and I don't have time to get into an academic discussion now about the definition of culture, but if I just talk about behaviours and expectations within a group of people, that's what I mean for the moment about culture and mores. Why did we develop that, whether religious or legal or any other form of cultural mores? We did it because humans develop rules to define in-groups, the in-group of perhaps 120 people, which they fiercely defend and the rules are very strong for, and we tend to fight with our groups, the not members of our group. And so we see in New Guinea the development of hundreds of languages even though they may be in the same valley, only separated by a, few, a mile or so, where you see the language is developed as a form of culture to create a definition of your in-group and your out-group. I'm Jewish. Jewish people have signs of their in-group, with little hats on their head or, or whatever. This is all signs of the fact that we grew in general, and I'm going back 20,000 years, I'm not talking about what's happened 20, 40, 30 years ago, we evolved our brains in a way to define the group that we would defend and, 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 and the rules we would comply with and be very certain that we could identify that we were members of that group. And if we didn't comply with the rules of that group, we were effectively expelled, which of course in evolutionary terms 20,000 years ago would have meant death. But on the other hand, groups other groups you came across, you might ignore or you might confront. And there's a lot of evidence about that. And I think it's awfully important to understand that, that the human brain evolved needing to have a set of rules. It needed to know, we, our brain needs to know the rules of the group we're identified with. Now that is understandable in a simpler society of 15,000 years ago. You can start to see where I'm heading in the modern world, which is very different in construct from that we're talking about. Now, I can support all of this with great scientific evidence. I just don't have time today uh, to do that. The second point I want to make is, so that's my comment on technology. I'm, I'm parsing my title. The second point I want to make is about that actually a very interesting construct. And it's actually a modern construct to all intents and purposes. There's puberty and there's adolescence. Puberty is a biological phenomenon. We all know what puberty means. It's when a person moves from, uh, from being a child to being an adult in physical terms. Women develop breasts and pubic hair and have a period, their first period. And while that's not strictly the end of puberty, we generally, for scientific reasons, regard the onset of 
first period, which we call menarche, as the end of puberty in girls. Boys, they develop bigger testicles, they develop pubic hair, they have a growth spurt, as do the girls, they develop more muscle, uh, they, get, they grow a beard, their voice breaks, and so forth. That's puberty in boys. And both of those are hormonal phenomena. The brain, at a certain point in development, triggers the vascular secretion of hormones by the ovaries in girls and the testes in boys that lead to um, these physical changes. But adolescence is not the same thing as the end of puberty. If adolescence is probably a social construct, or at least it may be a social construct. I'm going to confuse you in a few moments about this. Adolescence ends when we accept somebody as an adult in our society, if you think about it. And so in a society in New Guinea, a girl might go through puberty at 12 or 13 and is immediately accepted as an adult. And there may be some initiation ceremonies, but she'll then be accepted as an adult in her tribe as a, with all the rights and roles of a woman in her tribe. What about New Zealand? When do we accept a young person as an adult? Now, I just want you to bear in mind these two points, end of puberty and end of adolescence, as two distinct points, one having a biological, one possibly having a social construct, but as I'll come to in confusion in a moment, there's a biological component to it as well. What's happened over time? Well, we actually don't know what happened more than a few hundred years ago with certainty, but I think we have pretty good rationale for what I think has happened. We know for certainty that the age of menarche, that is the age of first, puberty, the first period in girls, has fallen by about five years for girls in Western society over the last 250 years. So the average age of first period in a girl in, let's say, um, Amsterdam or Vienna 250 years ago was about 17 to 18 years of age. It's now between 11 and 12 years of age. A dramatic drop in five years, uh, five years in just 400 years. Now why has that drop happened? What's happened is our children are healthier. We know what delays puberty. <coughs> poor nutrition, infection in childhood, etc. Et it's a bit more, I'm simplifying a complex story. And of course the enlightenment in Europe, that transition which happened 250 years ago, started that people, children, started to be valued in a different way and we started to see a reduction in the age of puberty. <coughs> but what happens that in 20,000 years ago? Well, we don't know for certain but the best evidence would suggest the age of puberty 20,000 years ago was probably roughly what it is now in well-nourished societies. It was probably girls had their period, first period between 11 and 12 years of age, so. But what happened was then we developed cities, towns and cities, and agriculture, and we know from the historical record that with that came more risk of malnutrition, because you couldn't chase your food, more risk of infection because you're living in closer circumstances. More risk of infection because you're living closer to <coughs> And so what we saw between 8,000 years ago and 200 years ago was a progress, progressive decline effectively in the living conditions of young people in terms of the I'm talking about now. And that probably delayed puberty. And now we're returning for girls the age of um, that we probably evolved to live with in the first place. Boys we know far less about, because with boys we don't actually, we have no single marker like first period on which to record things, but the best evidence we have comes from the records of the Vienna Boys Choir. When do boys, boys, the boys, boys are afraid, and when do they get thrown out of the choir? And it shows exactly the same trend. Dramatic drop of four to five years in 
the age of puberty of boys by over the same period of time. Boys go through puberty as we know in general about a year later than girls. And of course the other point to make is puberty is not a single point in time. It takes three to four years for a girl from the first sign of breast development to the time of the first period. But the girl is going to have her first period at the age of 12, she's probably starting her breast development at the age of 7 to 8. So there's interesting implications for primary school. So that's puberty. But now let's talk about adolescence, because this is where the problems come. Remember I introduced this concept of match. And I think it's reasonable based on anthropological considerations of what we see in the few uh, societies that still live in the world of the little breaks down, to see that girls 20,000 years ago went through puberty, went through initiations of whatever would be appropriate in that culture, and then became treated as adult women of reproductive age within their society. Not, it's not instantaneous, it's about a two year gap between the first period and when most girls become uh, reproductively fully competent, although clearly that doesn't mean you shouldn't try contraception immediately <coughs> after the first period. I'm not saying that. And I think in boys it's a little less clear, but it looks silly. And so let me go to 200 years ago. Think about a girl in Western Europe. She went through puberty, at the, had a first period at the age of 17 or 18. She was probably married, if she was going to be married, within a year or two of that, and treated as an adult within the society. What about boys? The average age of midshipmen in Nelson's Navy was 12 to 13 years of age. Would we allow a 12 or 13 year old boy to be on a naval ship now, if we had him? Um, uh, you know, you, that just puts it in, in, in stark contrast the way things have changed. And I'm talking largely about Western society because that's what I know most about. But I think people of different cultures can see that that in the different traditions that was true, that in the absence of technologies, people went from being a child to a very short adolescence of one to two years to being an adult, irrespective of whether it was at a young age or to... But what's happened in the last <coughs> period of time? We certainly don't treat or think of a person of, who may have had their period at the age of 12 or 14, as being an adult. When do they become an adult? Well, those of us as parents will have different views on that. But certainly, in most social, even in legal terms, we think in terms of when you have the right to vote, when you have the right to do certain things. It's certainly in the late teens, if not into the early 20s. Rental car companies won't allow you to rent a car till you're 25. Um, so what's happened? Is this just a social construct that we're treating young people differently, or is there something deeper going on? Now, for a long time, I think we thought it was largely a social construct. <coughs> but recent work using very fancy brain scanning techniques has shown that the brain was not fully mature until between 25 and 30 years of age. And the last part of the brain to mature are what we call the contractalamic pathways, which are effectively pathways involved in lay people's terms and what we would call wisdom and judgment. And putting in balance, you know, and what do I mean by judgment and wisdom? We're really trying to balance off between what we'd really like to do and the constraints of the group we want to live in, so we actually inhibit the reward-seeking pleasures of doing things that might break group rules, to comply with group rules, or because it's a rational judgment to make, uh, not to go bungee jumping or whatever else. Don't know anybody does it. Um, my point I'm making here, and I'll come back to this interesting phenomenon of the brain maturation in the pathway very instantaneously. But I just want to summarise what I'm saying to date, in case I've 
been a bit waffly in my jet lag state. The first is, the point I'm making is adolescence or prolonged adolescence as an evolutionary novel phenomenon in a society that is changing dramatically. Where adolescence might have been two years old at most for a woman, let's say 250 years ago, it's probably a decade in length or of that order of magnitude for males and females in Western society now. And so the issue is, what's going on? I've explained why the age of puberty has fallen, which is part of the story, but why at the same time are we seen to be delaying the acceptance of people of adults in society, which is going on at the same time. And I think the question is this one about brain maturation. We don't know whether the brain always took 30 years, 25 years, let's say, to be fully mature or not. But let me put three theories to you, two of which I think, and, and they're not mutually exclusive. They all go together. The first is, the brain always took 25 years to be fully mature process of living in your society or in your culture, it didn't matter because the society of 30, 20,000 years ago was so much simpler. Even the society of 300 years ago was so much simpler. We didn't have taxmen, we didn't have, we didn't have lawyers, we didn't have accountants, we didn't have telecom, we didn't have politics. You know, there was a lot of things we didn't have. Instead, we had a very clear set of rules from the priest or the politician or the village chief that defined the way we lived our lives. And we were in deep trouble if we broke those rules. Or we exported to Australia. We were in the worst way. Um, the sec so that's the first hypothesis. That in fact, the brain always took so long that these very last high functions had only become of importance in this very, very different world that we've created in the last few years. A lot of evidence to argue that's the case. The second is that because living in this modern world is in reality so much more complicated, it takes a lot longer to learn those skills, and it just takes longer for the brain to mature to get to, to do all that learning. Now, I would, I think there's technical reasons for excluding that as an explanation, but, but it's one that some people have looked for. The third which is perhaps the most controversial in that it has the most impact on the way we think, but for which I think there is a lot of growing in <coughs> to make us look at it properly. It's what I call the switch we've made in child rearing. And that switch is what I call going from loose tight to tight loose. What I mean by that is for those of you who are my age, so, 80 or older, will remember that young people up to the age of puberty had a pretty uncontrolled life. Yes, they went to school, but after they got home at 3 o'clock, they were out there climbing trees, doing all sorts of risk taking behaviours. You know, parents didn't know where they were, they were and they would drift home when they were hungry at about 7 o'clock at night and go to bed. And there wasn't stuff with music and ballet and uh, extra French classes, or that, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And nobody's worried about a pedophile potentially doing something down the road. And adolescence was a very different story. You went to a school which gave you limited choices. You had your five subjects, and you could do that course or that course. And depending on how they rated you, that was it. You, were, you had no choice. And there wasn't much to do after school. You came, you, you did the sport of that after school. You came home. There wasn't television. You, you, you might have played with your mates, but you didn't. You weren't out on the town every night with your bit of plastic. And, 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 and certainly, uh, it was a very different lifestyle for adolescents. It was a much tighter lifestyle. Parents basically had them under control because it was because money. Adolescents didn't have access to a lot of money and a lot of independence in the way they lived their lives. But now it's totally reversed. Pre-pubertal children, particularly school-aged children, have very tightly controlled lives. Every, the ability to explore and take some risk-taking behaviour has largely gone. 
in our society. They are managed very heavily by both school and parent. And adolescents, we have no bloody idea what they're doing. Do they? I mean, on the end, like, whether they're physically at home or not, they're not with you. Uh, and because of this thing, they're out of control anyhow. Uh, they have access, you know, it's not only that on a Saturday night you had 10 bucks and you'd somehow steal a few, an illicit can or two of beer. Now they can go out and run out of beer, we'll get into a machine and get some more. It's a very different world. And I think there's a lot of interest in my community of people who are thinking about this issue. We know at the end of the day that brain pathways, the whole point of learning is the brain pathway is reinforced by what you do. And if we have got out of sync the balance between risk-taking behaviour and controlled behaviour, it's no surprise it might be affecting the way controlling it. the part of the part of the brain involved in risk management in effect is out of kilter. It's a hypothesis, it's not been proven, it is testable. Uh, it would be expensive to test it. But in fact, it is a growing hypothesis that there are fundamental changes in the way our brains may be developed. And we'll come back to that momentarily in a different way. <coughs> now, what are the consequences of this mismatch? Am I talking bullshit? Probably am, but that's another matter. Um, uh, Tweeters think I do all the time. Uh, the, um, the best study comes from Switzerland. <coughs> and in Switzerland, the only way only the Swiss can do it, they took every adolescent in a, in a canton, a French-speaking canton, and they did an enormously extensive psychological examination on every adolescent in a canton, many thousand. And what they found is quite frightening. They found that children who were the youngest group in terms of biological maturation. So this is not abnormal, medically abnormal people, but the youngest third had by far the greatest psychological morbidity. So for instance, the rate of suicide was five to, or attempted suicide was five to eight times higher in boys who have had their puberty in the lowest third of the eight compared to the, their peers who had their puberty in the middle or upper third of age range. In girls, we know, we've known for a long time, the younger the age of menarche, the greater the risk of eating disorders. Now, if you go on and on at length, but basically this is saying, and it's just giving strength to my hypothesis, that, that the greater the mismatch, in your biological maturation and, the, and, and your adolescence ma and your acceptance as an adult in your society, the greater the morbidity. And whether you look at drug abuse, sexual abuse, adolescent, uh, acting out behaviours of different kind, alcohol, binge drinking, every statistic you look at appears to follow the same trend. The greater the mismatch, the greater the risk we're at. Now, so we are faced inevitably that this mismatch between our inherent biology with the age of puberty falling because we are healthy, our children are healthier, but the complexity of the society and the way we're bringing children up in that society means the age of maturation is greater with this new phenomenon of prolonged adolescence. Now I want to layer on top of that in the last five minutes or ten minutes you have to shut me up in a moment. Uh, the complexity of what's happened with the last, the last revolution, the, the information revolution. What it's meant, and, and, and all the other things that have gone on, if you think about what's happened in the last hundred years, and it will take, we've seen, since the development of the telephone and the motor car, that cities have become really large, conflated, human organisations rather than a series of urban villages. We've seen, more recently with the development of the internet, tweet, uh, you know, Facebook, all these, these things that people communicate at distances and in different ways and label people as friends in different ways to what they used to. 
So know their social network is bigger and less well defined than it was. And you're seeing that in some very interesting ways. For example, face to face, the number of people you'll tell about your intimate sex life is very few. But look at what happens on Facebook or on Twitter. You've changed the, the content of discourse and the range of people you have discourse with. It's a consequence of technology. And it's just exacerbating this mismatch in people whose brains are not well enough adjusted to manage the risk-reward ratio from the vicarious pleasure they're getting about boasting about some particular sexual episode or whatever, and the reality of the consequences of doing so. And I'm using that as an example because it's an easy one to understand. But I want you to just project that further into the next problem. And that is that in this modern world, we've changed the fundamental way we communicate. I'm talking to you face to face, verbal, using my hands, using my body seeing my expression. 140 characters on a tweet is a very different way of communicating. And there's a lot of loss of information in that. And I think we don't know what that's going to mean in the way young people grow up in this digital world. Because it will have consequences. They may be good, they may be bad. We have no, I don't know. I can go on about the literature on that. But it will certainly have consequences because it's fundamental that children who are growing up in this world of digital natives are learning to communicate and are communicating in different ways. And in some ways that will impact on the way they, they transition through adolescence and the way they act as adults. You know, we worried a lot about the introduction of genetic modification, a technology which I think we probably overreacted to, largely for values-based reasons. But here's a technology which has far more fundamental influences on the fundamentals of our society, which has just drifted in, in an irreversible way, as most technologies do, namely the internet and that around it. The other, you know, in my way, the internet is the biggest uncontrolled experiment of new technologies in social science. The the other thing that's happened is as societies and cities have got more connected within themselves, the definition of groups has been changed. You know, in more homogenous societies of the past, where religion was dominant and, 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 and families were of a different construct, people knew what group they belonged to and they knew they were in deep shit if they, if they if they didn't comply with groups. But now, of course, people move between groups. You can be in this group in society or that group in society, and gangs are actually a manifestation of that. Gangs are a group, are simply groups that establish their own rules. They may be antithetical to everybody else's rules, but they, where people move when they don't like the rules of the group they're into, they move to another group, and ultimately they may move into a gang, which has, as even stricter rules of breaking the, the gang rules that, 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 that the things they were objecting to in the first place. And I, you know, it's a very interesting phenomenon, this one of group conflation and the fact that young people no longer have a single set of rules to comply for, but they can choose at different stages in their lives or different stages which group they're in. Are they in a family group? Are they in a religious group? Are they in some other identity group ultimately leading into a gang or something else. So, I think young people have it tough. They're living in a world young people have never lived in before and about which we don't understand enough of. It's not their fault they live in a world with better nutrition and in a more complex society in which they've got to transition. Our fault, our obligation in my mind, is to do the work which will understand how to make more people resilient to managing your way through this world. Now, we're at early stages in understanding that, and at this stage I think it is still not well proven. I think one of the things that I hope that Superall will do 
is look at this area in some depth, because I actually think the challenge I'm stating here is fundamental in this society, which, because of its multiple cultural origins, has even more complexities than more ethnically homogeneous societies around the world. The one clue we have comes from the kind of work that people like James Heckman did, early childhood education. And it comes back to the point I made about loose, tight, tight, loose uh, uh, maturation. That work, which unfortunately is actually based on relatively few studies of very intensely studied children like the Head Start programs in the United States, the very physical program in Chicago, the Absidarian program and so forth, has suggested that the most important period for developing resilience is early childhood. And that, that links to my argument about when influencing the patterns of brain development to allow people to have resilience through this transition. And what that work shows is that children from the poorest and most deprived backgrounds in the United States, when they were given very expensive, and it was very expensive, interventional programs, did better. But it mattered how you looked at how they did better. If you just look at a, just IQ, or some measure like that, a cognitive performance didn't make much difference. But we've known for a long time that IQ or measures like that are not a good predictor of how people survive and thrive and life. But when they went out beyond that and looked at things like stable relationships, stable employment, earning rates, and particularly crime and incarceration rates, the, the results are phenomenal. You have to go out looking 20, 30, 40 years, but when they do so, they see rates of return which annualise at 10 to 15 percent in economic terms alone, provided you price in the effects on, on crime. Now, if you think about this country, what do we worry about most? We worry about people, our young people getting the skills to cope in a complex society. We don't want them to end up in prison. We don't want them to end up falling irreversibly off the rails. We worry about um, uh, all these behavioural things. We think our young people don't know how to sustain jobs, etc., etc. I think the evidence is pointing that that is a result of this fundamental mismatch and complexity of a society we weren't designed to live in, associated with the fact that we can probably do something about it by enhancing the resilience of people. The issue is really one of intergenerational uh, uh, commitment because this generation would have to make <coughs> investment for children who are going to, for a benefit that's going to come 20, 30 years later. These are complex issues. The ones that I think Super and the Families Commission is transitioning to be able to look at and need scientific analysis. And what I'm suggesting is that these science that spreads from traditional social science to quite deep biological and neurological science alongside it. And what's happened, sadly, in the sciences, and where a lot of my effort goes, where my prime ministerial role is, to break down the silos and barriers in sciences. That what we need to do is understand that these complex, some people use the word wicked, I don't like the word wicked, these complex and critical problems need true multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. And it's not a matter of the anthropological perspective or the evolutionary perspective or the sociological perspective being the right one. We need to work out better ways to integrate these perspectives to really understand what's going on. So my, in summary, it's simple. We've created a world our young people have to grow up in, which is much more complex than the world we grew up in, and is much more complex than our great 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 grandparents lived in, and their great 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 grandparents lived in. That somewhere in the middle of all of this, we probably can't do much 
about the world they live in, and so our obligation is to find ways to make greater resilient strategies for improving the resilience to living in that world. 